So our third speaker is um, Brendan Rooney. And you all know Brendan's an assistant professor in the UCD School of Psychology. He's director of the Media and Entertainment Psychology Lab. His research interests include social cognition, perception, and how cognitive and emotional processes interact in the context of the media, the arts, and entertainment. He's the founder of the Psychological Society of Ireland Special Interest Group on Media, the Arts, and Cyber Psychology. And he's a, um, a member and fellow of the Society of Cognitive Studies, the Mo Moving Image. And he's going to talk today about um, using media and entertainment to explore emotion and social cognition. Thanks a million, Brendan. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, I was glad Eilish kind of talked about the need to uh, connect today because I think a theme um, of the content of my talk and the research in the lab and also the form of my talk is about that balance between kind of being very abstract and showing the broad kind of range of the work we're doing but also trying to give you some sort of detail of a contribution that we're making. So I'm going to go into one of the projects that's really in early stages but it's one that I'm thinking about a little bit lately. But before I do that, I try and give you a sense of my interests and some of the work we're doing in the lab. Um, my interests are briefly around uh, emotion and social cognition. And these are really interesting constructs, I guess, for all of us. But um, I was challenged by the difficulty in trying to quantify something that's multidimensional, dynamic, really embedded in contexts, uh, processes that unfold over time. But to do so in a way that's also uh, rich and meaningful and so I'm interested in the idea of ecological validity and research methods and in that context media and entertainment experiences are super interesting and helpful for me to explore these things because video games films even um, books and paintings they're highly designed experiences by um, experts and they can really successfully capture our attention and move our emotions and um, that's really amenable to quantitative methods, but at the same time, they're really emotional, embedded, rich experiences as well. So if experts in this area can do it, I thought we could do it too. Um, but in order to use media and entertainment experiences in the lab, we also uh, need to understand the way in which cognition and emotion interact in that context. And so there's two main aims in the lab. One is to explore the basics of, of the way in which we kind of emotionally and cognitively respond to these sorts of experiences. And then the second is to take that information and to start to embed positive change within media and entertainment experiences. So I'm going to quickly move over that first aim and just say that a lot of that work in the lab has looked at, let's see, has looked at, um, the way in which media and entertainment experiences are designed and how those design features and choices around the construction of these fabricated experiences map onto cognitive and emotional responses. And almost entirely in the lab, the researchers uh, shown here with their uh, co-supervisors are interested in virtual reality at the moment, with the exception of Peter, who did this beautiful painting, so kind of overlaps in both. Peter's um, interested in art more broadly and painting specifically. So there's lots of research in the lab at the moment about the design of media experiences and how they interact with psychological um, variables, you could say. Um, but lately, I'm moving into this field of uh, applying that information in some way. And so our colleague Sarah Carroll in the school is also working in Crumlin Children's Hospital with um, Amory Casey, who came to me, and they presented a particular uh, issue that they're facing quite a lot. Um, Children in Irish hospitals are staying there on average 2.3 days, but even an hour in a waiting room in a hospital can be quite boring and stressful at the same time. And uh, some children are there for months, um, if not longer. And so uh, this prolonged hospitalization is obviously linked to boredom and isolation, but at the times when things aren't boring, um, they're the opposite, right? So children are faced with lots of medical procedures, surgery, think of sedation, uh, taking medications, the needles, and so um, when they're not boring, they're actually quite stressful, and that anxiety can be uh, associated with um, adverse post-operative recovery, increased complications and heightened pain experiences in children. Um, traditional solutions are often around medication or anesthesia for surgical procedures, and that can be problematic in terms of um, the, the child's and the family's uh, understanding, experience and ownership of it, but also 
it can lead to longer procedure times and with wait lists and access to an MRI. Um, the <coughs> consultants were saying that the, it just takes longer when the child has to be anaesthetized. So all of this in the context of what I said earlier might kind of um, suggest a possible <coughs> solution where the work in my lab might be able to contribute in some way. And you're kind of primed here to see something that's almost definitely working, like the evidence base is there, but it's being used quite often as well, that uh, things like virtual reality, or you can imagine in a completely different context, a parent giving a child a screen because it just works, it just distracts the children. And so, um, but I think why Amory came to me was we felt like we could be doing more than just distracting children who are undergoing these medical procedures. Um, and so before I come back to our ideas around that project, I'll give you uh, just some findings from a different project that helped kind of inform me around that. So um, some of you know Claire Howland. Um, she's a former PhD and graduate from the Media and Entertainment Psychology Lab and School of Psychology. And I'll talk a little bit about Claire's work and there's lots of research that shows that music is successful in music listening interventions for pain. Um, but there's very little research around the mechanisms by which it actually works. And if we can understand those mechanisms, then we can start to embed them into other sorts of experiences. I'm going to pull out two uh, illustrative uh, studies with findings from Claire's work. Um, Claire took a systematic review of uh, studies that you successfully use music as an intervention for pain and she went through those studies and found references to the music that was actually used and then was able to classify that music into whether or not the experimenter uh, chose the music or whether uh, the patient chose it from a limited choice or whether they had an unlimited choice. She was able to take those tracks with the help of research assistants and um, look at their Spotify features. So using the Spotify algorithm, it will take a track and tell you based on the <coughs> tempo and the beats and whether there's lyrics, um, different features of that music. And three, I mean, there's, two, there's like the, the, the level of groove or the level of um, <coughs> instrumentalness, for example. Um, in this graph here, um, the higher the uh, bar, um, the higher it is on that Spotify feature, and there were three that were significantly different and interesting to us. The energy of the music, its instrumentalness, and this was basically did it have lyrics or not, and the danceability. So imagine I asked you to pick some music for someone who's experiencing pain. It kind of makes intuitive sense that you'd say, let's give them something calming or relaxing and maybe some classical music. Whereas when patients were given the choice, they were choosing music with higher energy and um, with lower instrumentalness, which is more lyrics and more danceability. Um, and so I guess that was one finding that as and it suggested this role of choice was an active mechanism in the use of music in um, these interventions. So to further explore that then, um, we had a lab-based study where participants had to have their hand in some ice cold water and the longer you can keep that in there, the, it's a kind of an index of how much pain you're feeling so you take it out when you have too much pain. Um, and so people would do that task as a measure of the duration they could keep it in as an index of pain and also their self-reported intensity and um, unpleasantness of the pain among other measures. And what we did was we um, had participants choose the track that they listened to to accompany this pain task. And that track um, may have been of a choice of two or four or they weren't given any choice. They were just told to listen to the music that was provided to them. Um, they were given three second segments of the music and they could kind of listen to a little bit. But um, the trick to the experiment was that it was an illusion of choice. Actually, the pieces of music were taken from the same track. So the music was held constant across the study. Um, and in that case, what we found was that where participants had more choice, they were able to keep their hand in the ice water for longer and that they reported it as less I actually can't remember if it was intense or unpleasant. I think it was the intensity was lower. Um, with Claire's other work and those findings, we built a model of the mechanisms by which music can help with pain. And the idea of an automated effect of just putting music on was kind of at the lower end. It was an instant response to music that people often feel. And it was seen as something that um, connects directly with someone's emotion. 
But beyond that then, when participants were given choice around the way they listened to the music, their choice of music itself, the setting that was in, they could start to make meaning from the music and uh, use it to regulate their emotion. Um, and so that was some of the context, as well as um, the research uh, in the lab from David Redmond, for example, in collaboration with uh, Pamela Gallagher, is looking at how uh, virtual reality experiences almost always are bringing people into some sort of enjoyable environment or, a, or a, an in, in the moment game-based activity, whereas there's very little research looking at the way in which it could connect with the person's sense of self. Um, so he was bringing participants around Google Earth where they would choose places maybe from their past or places that they wanted to go that were meaningful to them. And it's finding that, that was a, a, there was significantly higher impact on, on mood and life satisfaction in those meaningful sorts of environments. All of this to say that when it comes to using VR in the hospital setting for distraction, it felt like, sure, that could work, but we might be missing a trick. Actually, we might be able to do a lot more. And so the question then is, can we do better? Can we capitalize on, think of the transformative uh, power of being able to go anywhere in the world or create any sort of environment. As Sims research in the lab is looking at the feelings of awe in these fantastical type environments and it, it's really a transformative emotion so can we use that um, I'm sorry to say I don't have findings for you this is towards the end of the, the, the presentation um, but that's the starting point and that's the connection between the team of what we'd like to do something differently but Asim has been doing some research out in Crumlin in, um, in a kind of an internship capacity um, as well and um, he designed a uh, kind of spaces in the hospital that are uh, virtual and so you can see these as tools that the psychologists or the play therapists can work with the children so that they have exposure to the places in the hospital or the sorts of tests or equipment that they'll see and it's a starting point for, point, point for them to become um, more empowered around the whole experience and um, they can be leaders and have choices but then Beyond that, then we can build in fun and play. And Asim met with the Youth Advisory Council as well in the context of this work to try and get their input into what are the ways that we can just make it more enjoyable. So we have had some funding um, to start this process and then we'll look for more um, from this point onwards. Um, so that's just a project to try and show how we're using the basic uh, ideas of emotion and media and entertainment and trying to embed positive change within that. Um, like I said, I tried to be kind of uh, uh, broad um, in some of the studies that I presented and these ones uh, didn't make the cut this time, but I did wanted to mention some other research that's ongoing, it's exciting. Um, if you look to the black boxes, they'll give you the themes of the research projects. Um, one uh, that myself and Lauren have been working on for a long time is around the way in which we can feel emotion towards things that are uh, unreal, fictional or virtual. And um, yeah, on Friday we got another paper uh, accepted for this project. Um, and then some other ones looking at um, some more of the cognitive and neuro aspects of, uh, of my interests. And then the last one is looking at, um, I presented stuff on close-ups before and how they can prompt character engagement and empathy. And so we're extending that work um, with Kathleen Ballon to look at how that might be able to prompt people to self-disclose through character engagement. And um, yeah, so uh, that's, uh, that's me there, my 